November 1796, Grand Duke Paul Petrovich strode through the corridors of the Winter Palace as his mother, Catherine the Great, lay dying. He was looking for Catherine's secret will, the one piece of paper that stood between him and the throne. Unless it was destroyed, the throne would pass directly to his son, Alexander, as Catherine had wished. Unlike his father, Alexander seemed born to rule. He had every natural gift, charm, intellect, and wit. The only thing he lacked was the desire to rule. Catherine's will never saw the light of day. The moment Paul had been waiting for for 34 years had arrived. At last, he was emperor. But in little more than four years, Alexander would stand over his father's bloodied body, and Catherine would at last have her way. Paul's birth had been a joyous event. As the great-grandson of Peter the Great, his destiny had always been to continue the Romanov line and one day rule Russia. But all his early years had been lived in the shadow of his mother, Catherine the Great. The eternal prince became lonely and secretive, retreating into an imaginary world of his own creation. Many thought he was mad and christened him the Russian Hamlet. Chapter one, Paul I Petrovich. Immediately after Paul's birth, he was taken from his mother by Empress Elizabeth, who raised him as her own. His mother, Catherine, was granted almost no access to her son. His father, the future Peter III, also saw little of the boy. There were rumors at court that Paul's real father was not Peter, but a courtier, Sergei Sontikov. Catherine herself encouraged these rumors, which undermined the husband she later deposed. Stories about Paul's uncertain parentage delighted courtiers, but as the prince grew up, the resemblance to Peter III was plain to see, both physically and in his strange mannerisms. Like his father, Paul liked to march around his palaces as though on military parade. He frequently baffled courtiers and ambassadors with his inane remarks, leaving his wife, the German princess Maria Fyodorovna, to cover up his strange behavior as best she could just as Catherine had to do for Emperor Peter. Nevertheless, Empress Elizabeth adored her great nephew, Paul. She began to consider making him her successor and bypassing his father, Peter, who she and many others believed was insane. To prepare Paul for rule, she found him the best tutors in Russia. Paul studied five languages, history, literature, mathematics, science, draftsmanship, and architecture, as well as riding, fencing, dance, carpentry, and chess. Paul himself insisted on studying the military sciences. To help with navigation lessons, his entire table was painted blue and marked up to look like a huge naval chart. The Empress Elizabeth died when Paul was seven, followed six months later by his father, Peter III, most likely murdered by his mother's supporters. His mother, Catherine, became Empress. Some believed she'd hand over power to her son when he came of age in 14 years' time. Instead, he'd have to wait 34 years. As a teenager, Paul was prone to depression. He was deeply ashamed of his mother's licentious behavior and terrified of her lovers. But his tutors noted his intelligence and interest in science, art, and mystical philosophy. From his reading, he developed a particular obsession with the Knights of Malta and dreamed of one day joining their ranks. 
Becoming emperor was a daunting prospect for Paul. His only happiness came from his friendship with a young count, Andrei Razumovsky. Paul wrote to him, your friendship has worked a miracle. I'm no longer plagued by all my old fears. No more chimeras, away black thoughts. When Paul turned 19, his mother found him a bride, the 18-year-old Wilhelmina Luisa, princess of Hesse-Darmstadt. Paul fell in love almost immediately. After converting to Russian Orthodoxy, Wilhelmina took the name Natalia Alexeyevna. But after four years of marriage, Natalia died, giving birth to a stillborn son. Paul went almost mad with grief. His mother chose to console him by revealing letters between Natalia and Razumovsky, proving his wife had been having an affair with his best friend. Paul never recovered from this blow. The lesson he drew was never to trust anyone again. His mother quickly found Paul another German princess to marry. Six months later, he was engaged to Sofia Dorothea of Württemberg, who took the Russian name Maria Fyodorovna. Paul's second marriage was a happy one, and in the course of 25 years, she gave birth to 10 royal children. These children would carry on the Romanov dynasty for the next 150 years. Her sons included the emperors Alexander I and Nicholas I. Her grandson was Alexander II, her great-grandson Alexander III, and her great-great-grandson Nicholas II. All surviving representatives of the House of Romanov are also her descendants. The couple honeymooned in Europe, traveling incognito under the names Count and Countess Sevenik, Russian for of the North. Few of their hosts were fooled, and across Europe, Paul was welcomed with a degree of respect he'd never received at home. In Vienna, the couple went to the court theater to see a performance of Hamlet. But when the lead found out who was in the audience, it was said he refused to go on stage, declaring, I cannot play the part of a prince who seeks revenge for his murdered father with the real thing watching from the royal box. Empress Catherine never let Paul interfere in affairs of state. She didn't even trust him to raise his own sons, Alexander and Constantine. To keep him out of the way, she bought him the Palace of Gacina, 25 miles outside St. Petersburg. For 20 years, Paul devoted himself to creating his own miniature kingdom at Gacina. He had the buildings renovated to imitate the latest European styles and made his guards wear Prussian-style uniforms and powdered wigs. Catherine's courtiers ridiculed Paul. One wrote, You can't observe the Grand Duke's behavior without disgust. He thinks himself the King of Prussia. Every Wednesday he conducts maneuvers. The 2,000 guardsmen of the Gacina garrison never saw action, but instead became the plaything of Grand Duke Paul. Like his father, he was obsessed with soldiering and was determined to make his troops the best drilled in Russia. They rehearsed volley fire, bayonet drill, amphibious landings and assaults, and trained with artillery. By 1796, they were the most disciplined and polished troops in the Russian army. Gachina drill went down in Russian military folklore. Before appearing on duty, each soldier was screwed into a special contraption to straighten his head and his back and keep them perfectly still. Their tight white breeches were pulled on wet and dried on the body, so there wasn't a single crease. Officers made the men practice marching with a glass of water on their head. If they spilled any water, they weren't keeping their heads still enough. 
even minor misdemeanors were punished with beatings. Changing the guard became an elaborate drill that lasted hours, and all soldiers marched with the famous high-stepping parade march still used by Russian guard regiments. Catherine ridiculed her son's military pretensions. She didn't like to have her son around court, but she lavished attention on her grandson, Alexander. In fact, she behaved exactly as her predecessor, Elizabeth, had done towards her own husband, Peter, which she'd so resented at the time. As soon as Alexander turned 16, Catherine arranged for him to marry a German princess and began to talk openly of bypassing her son and leaving the throne to her grandson instead. This was when Paul began to fear for his life. On the night of November 6th, 1796, Paul and his wife had the same dream. An unseen force raised them up and carried them through the darkness. They woke up in terror just as a messenger arrived from St. Petersburg. He announced that Catherine the Great was dying. Within hours, Paul was Emperor of Russia. And he was soon passing laws at a dizzying rate, as though he didn't believe he had much time. In the course of his four and a half year reign, Paul passed 7,865 acts of legislation, twice as many as Peter the Great had passed in his 43 year reign, and one and a half times as many as Catherine the Great in her 34 year reign. He also found time to issue 14,207 orders concerning the army. The emperor rose at 4 a.m. and worked in his office until 9, where he received visitors and reports. Then he rode out, usually accompanied by Grand Duke Alexander, to visit some state establishment. The changing of the guard was held at 11. Then, after an hour's walking through St. Petersburg's streets, the emperor returned to the parade ground to inspect the guard. He even measured the length of the soldiers' pigtails and checked the amount of powder in their hair. Officers were punished severely for the smallest faults. In just the first three days of Paul's reign, the emperor dismissed 16 lieutenant generals, 57 major generals, and three full generals. Over four years, 2,594 officers resigned, including 333 generals. The emperor's behavior created an atmosphere of permanent anxiety. The wife of his military adjutant remembered, his victims formed an endless procession to the fortress. Often their only fault was hair that was too long or a jacket that was too short. The wearing of vests was strictly forbidden. If the emperor spotted anyone wearing a vest, the unfortunate owner was sent straight to the guardhouse. Even ladies sometimes ended up there if they saw the emperor and didn't jump out of their carriage quickly enough to make the proper curtsy. This is why the streets he used to walk along in St. Petersburg quickly became deserted. Everyone trembled before the emperor. Paul imagined himself as a perfect chivalric knight become emperor, and he had not forgotten his childhood dream of joining the Knights of Malta. When Napoleon conquered their home island in 1798, Paul offered the knights a new home in Russia and became their grand master, even though he was orthodox and it was a Catholic order. Paul became the first Russian emperor to meet the Pope, Pius VI, even inviting him to move to Russia when Rome was also occupied by Napoleon. In Paul's eyes, Napoleon represented a world evil that had to be defeated. He allied Russia with the coalition of powers fighting against him and sent an army under the brilliant Field Marshal Suvorov to Europe. In 1799, in northern Italy, 
Suvorov won three battles in just four months, but was then forced to execute a dramatic but brilliant strategic retreat across the Swiss Alps in winter. The emperor resented Suvorov for opposing his military reforms, but even he confessed his admiration for this latest achievement, telling Suvorov, the only victory you had yet to win was over nature itself. Even there, you now have the upper hand. Paul set out to undo all his mother's reforms, which meant his next target was Russia's own nobility, who had thrived under Catherine's rule. He ended their exemption from taxes and corporal punishment, turning them into powerful enemies. Paul tried to watch everything and everyone. Stacks of unread reports began to pile up on his desk. Because of a mass purging of the civil service, there weren't enough staff left to run the offices of state. The British ambassador, Sir Charles Whitworth, who was watching the emperor carefully, wrote troubling reports to London. The emperor has gone mad. Since the moment he ascended the throne, his physical state has worsened. The emperor's behavior became more and more strange. He no longer went for walks along the embankment because he feared the strong wind might blow his head away like a soap bubble. He suffered from insomnia, so his loyal wife Maria walked with him all night so he wouldn't pester the guards with nonsensical questions. A conspiracy against him was now formed. It included Count Palin, governor of St. Petersburg, Vice-Chancellor Nikita Panin, Catherine's favorite Platon Zuboff, General Benigson, General Uvarov, and many others, perhaps as many as 300 people. Grand Duke Alexander didn't join the conspirators, but nor did he stop them. He only insisted they did not harm a hair on his father's head. The conspirators swore to it. They wanted Paul to abdicate and retire to Mikolovsky Castle, or as a last resort, they would lock him up. Mikhailovsky Castle was Paul's newest palace, his fantasy made real. The designs had taken years, but their realization had had to wait until Catherine the Great's death. As soon as Paul was emperor, construction began and was finished in just three and a half years. Paul ordered the court to move here while the interiors were still unfinished. Its dark stairways and eerie corridors created a strange, unsettling atmosphere, but Paul felt at home. The emperor's behavior was becoming even more unpredictable. He sat for hours in deep thought, he began to suspect his wife and sons of plotting against him. He wrote a secret letter and hid it in a chest with a note reading, to be opened by our descendant 100 years after my death. It was known that it concerned the fate of the dynasty and that Paul had written it after speaking with a prisoner from the Peter and Paul fortress named Abel. Abel was a monk born Vasily Vasiliev in 1757, who took his monastic vows at the island monastery of Valam. He was later said to have gained the gift of prophecy and wrote many of his visions down in a book. It's claimed he accurately predicted many events, some of which took place during his lifetime, such as the death of Catherine the Great, the death of Paul, Napoleon's invasion of Russia, the Decembrist revolt, as well as more distant events, including the First World War, the Russian Revolution, the murder of the last Tsar, civil war, repression, and war with Hitler. Abel had been locked up for prophesying the death of the last empress, but he was summoned from his prison cell to speak with Paul. When asked what future he saw for the emperor, Abel replied, your reign will be short. You will be strangled in your bedchamber by scoundrels who even now you hold in your warm embrace. He even named the day, March 11th. 
On the evening of the 11th, Paul dined with his family. At one point, he looked into a mirror and joked, what a funny mirror. I can see myself in it with a broken neck. At that moment, the conspirators were holding their final meeting at Count Palin's house. When someone asked what they should do if the emperor resisted, Palin answered, omelets are not made without breaking eggs. After dinner, the emperor suddenly said, what will be, will be, and went to his bedchamber. He checked the doors and windows and wondered why the crows in the summer garden were making such a fuss. His assassins were passing through the summer garden on their way to the palace. When they arrived, the guards let them in. Paul heard heavy footsteps in the corridor and knew they'd come for him. The conspirators included ex-army officers, many of whom were drunk. They burst into the emperor's bedroom and found him hiding behind a screen. They tried to make him sign his abdication, but he refused. Then Platon Zubov struck him on the temple with a golden snuff box, like a pair of brass knuckle dusters. The emperor fell to the ground. Paul fought bravely, one against a dozen, but they beat him senseless and then throttled him with his own scarf. The Russian people were told Emperor Paul I had died from an apoplectic stroke. Indeed, insiders joked, the stroke of a snuff box to the head. The French artist Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun witnessed the reaction to the emperor's death. The city went wild with delight. People were singing, dancing and kissing in the streets. The people I knew would run up to my carriage, shake my hand and exclaim, now we are free. Many households even hung out lights. The death of this unhappy emperor caused universal joy Within hours of Paul's death, his son, the new emperor Alexander, issued a declaration promising to rule in the spirit of his grandmother, Catherine the Great. But he did not share in the general sense of jubilation. He was sickened by the events of the previous night. He had only wanted what was best for Russia, but his good intentions had paved the way to hell, his own personal hell, that would remain with him for the rest of his life. Chapter 2, Alexander I Pavlovich. It was Catherine the Great who chose the name Alexander for Paul's first son. Officially, he was named in honor of the Russian hero Alexander Nevsky. In reality, after the great conqueror Alexander the Great. The Empress showered all the motherly affection she had denied to her son Paul on this boy, her first grandson. Catherine wrote about the little prince with pride. She described a boy who was courteous, cheerful and obedient, and who made an effort to be liked. Everyone expected great things from Alexander. He was watched all the time. It was like being always on stage, and in time, he developed a mask for every occasion. 
The politician Baron Korf noted, the emperor could penetrate minds and see to the bottom of people's souls without ever revealing his own thoughts and feelings. Alexander knew his grandmother wanted to leave the throne to him instead of his father, but he did not relish the prospect. The only person he trusted was his Swiss tutor, Frederick Le Harp. A Republican and an idealist, Le Harp was appointed by Catherine to instill her own enlightened humanist values in the young prince. Alexander was not yet 15 when the Empress arranged for him to meet two sisters, princesses of Baden, 13-year-old Louise and 11-year-old Dorothea. Alexander was to choose one of them to marry. He chose the elder, Louise, who converted to orthodoxy and took the name Elizabeth. They were married the following year. Courtiers nicknamed the newlyweds Cupid and Psyche. Alexander's charming, beautiful bride inspired many artists and poets. Theodore Glinka wrote of her, gentle queen, glory of the czars. Your divine face is worthy of altars. Elizabeth would go on to become renowned as a Russian patriot. During the Napoleonic Wars, she founded a society to support the sick and wounded and pay for their hospital treatment. She founded orphanages and schools for the children of officers killed in the war, as well as other charitable institutions. Elizabeth was considered the great beauty of her age. Guards officers formed clubs inspired by their love for her. For all of Russian society, she became an emblem of love, beauty and virtue. But when Elizabeth first arrived at the Russian court during the reign of Alexander's father, Paul, she found it a place of anxiety and gloominess. The emperor constantly found fault with everyone, even Elizabeth. And as the young couple grew up, their different temperaments became more obvious. Alexander was passionate, Elizabeth cool. They drifted apart and in time took other lovers. In the sixth year of marriage, Elizabeth gave birth to a daughter, Maria, but she died within the year. With each passing year, Alexander realized he didn't want to become emperor. He dreamt of leaving everything behind and going to live with Elizabeth by the River Rhine in romantic seclusion. In a letter to a trusted friend, he confessed, I realized that I wasn't born for the title I bear now, and even less for the one destined for me. I've sworn to myself to refuse it in one way or another. The certainties of the Gacina parade ground became almost a place of psychological relief. During training, a cannon went off next to Alexander, leaving him deaf in his left ear. His deafness led to a paranoid fear that people were always laughing at him behind his back. On one occasion, he passed three officers sharing a joke and laughing amongst themselves. He ordered one of them to his office. As the officer arrived, Alexander was examining himself in the mirror. What's funny about me, he asked. Why did you laugh at me? It was impossible to persuade the Grand Duke that they'd been laughing at something else. When Alexander became emperor, his first acts were to revoke all the unpopular decrees of his father, Paul. He closed the secret chancellery, allowed nobles to travel abroad once more, 
and restored their other rights and privileges. Everyone had their own plan to reform the empire in the name of progress and enlightenment. So Alexander assembled a group of friends and advisors, all young liberals like himself, educated in the European style, to decide the way forward. Within two years, Alexander's privy committee had created new government ministries to replace the old collegia and put in place progressive education reforms. Universities were open to everyone, censorship laws were relaxed, and five new universities were founded. A first step was taken towards reforming Russia's serf laws. A new decree allowed serfs to buy their freedom if their owners agreed. They were to form a new class of free plowmen. The reforms moved slowly and faced significant opposition. Alexander was dismayed. Everyone seemed to think only about their own interests. No one seemed to share his concern for the common good. Then he found a man who seemed to understand and share his dream for Russia perfectly. Extraordinarily intelligent and hardworking, his name was Mikhail Speransky. He became first the secretary to the Privy Committee and later the emperor's right-hand man. The emperor himself took on responsibility for foreign policy. The great threat remained Napoleon Bonaparte, who had now crowned himself Emperor of the French. He threatened to overthrow the established order of Europe, and war loomed once more. In 1805, at Austerlitz, in today's Czech Republic, they met in the Battle of the Three Emperors, Alexander of Russia and Francis II of Austria, against Napoleon. The old veteran General Kutuzov commanded the Russian army, but Alexander, jealous of Napoleon's martial glory, took charge himself. Alexander saw his army crushed and routed and was forced to flee to save his own life those close to him saw the emperor trembling and weeping. A Cossack brought him some wine. He eventually calmed down and fell asleep on a bed of straw inside a shed. After the disaster at Austerlitz, Alexander never again interfered in military strategy. He kept to his own forte, diplomacy. Even his great adversary, Napoleon, recognized his charm. The Russian emperor is intelligent, pleasant, and well-educated, but he cannot be trusted. He is insincere. He is a subtle deceiver, a devious fellow. Two more years of war followed. Then, in 1807, the two emperors agreed to meet to negotiate peace. Their armies were separated by the river Neman, so they met on a specially constructed raft in the middle of the river near the town of Tilsit. Alexander and Napoleon sat under a grand canopy, one on one, without generals or attendants, and talked for two hours. At Tilsit, they signed a peace treaty, which committed Russia to join Napoleon's continental blockade against Britain. It caused Russian exports to fall by 20%, with serious consequences for the economy. French exports fell by a similar amount. But soon Russia was preparing for another war against France. Alexander was in no doubt that further conflict was unavoidable. In anticipation, Alexander almost doubled spending on the army, from 63.4 million rubles to 118.5 million. On June 12, 1812, Napoleon's Grand Armée of 450,000 men began to cross the River Neman. Alexander had no more than 200,000 men with which to face him. On the first day of the war, Alexander went to Moscow to address his people from the ancient capital. During an open-air service, he was profoundly moved when a peasant shouted out to him, Lead us, dear father. We will die, all of us but we will win.
The next day, Alexander issued an imperial decree, stating, I will not lay down my arms while a single enemy soldier remains in my realm. Hot-headed generals like Bagration wanted to meet Napoleon in one great decisive battle. But Alexander instead approved a policy of strategic retreat put forward by Barclay de Tolly. Napoleon was forced to advance further and further into Russia, hoping to trap the Russian army and inflict a crushing defeat that would force Alexander to give in. As the people of St. Petersburg prepared to flee, fearing Napoleon would soon reach the capital, Alexander was haunted by visions of his murdered father. He was certain he was to blame for his father's death, and the invasion was God's punishment for his unforgivable sin. He shared his fears with his close friend, Prince Galitzin. Galitzin turned to the Bible for guidance. He let a page fall open at random. It was a verse from Psalm 91. My refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Alexander, who'd never shown much interest in religion before, was greatly affected. He wrote to a friend describing his revelation. I devoured the Bible, finding its words poured into me anew, bringing a peace to my heart that I'd never known before. The emperor stepped aside from military affairs and handed supreme command to the 67-year-old Kutuzov. Kutuzov, a veteran of four wars, decided it was time to fight the great battle everyone had been waiting for, near a village called Borodino, 70 miles from Moscow. When news arrived of the outcome, it was clear that both sides had suffered heavy losses, but that Napoleon had not been stopped. Alexander then received news that Kutuzov intended to abandon Moscow. The emperor's nerves were close to breaking. He paced around his office for an entire night. When he emerged in the morning, he was berated by his brother Constantine, while his mother, the dowager empress, became hysterical. Only his wife noticed the emperor had turned half gray overnight. On September 2nd, Napoleon entered the Kremlin and settled in Alexander's state apartments. The very same day, Moscow began to burn from fires lit across the city. Four days later, Napoleon sent his first letter to Alexander, offering to negotiate a peace. There was no answer. Napoleon sent two more letters, but Alexander remained silent. The emperor shared his thoughts in letters to his beloved sister, Catherine. I'd rather cease to exist than make peace with that monster who brings misery to all. I trust in God for the incredible spirit of my people and for the resoluteness with which I decided not to bow down beneath the yoke. In October, Napoleon's army began its long retreat from Moscow. Harassed by Cossacks and decimated by the cold, it became one of the great catastrophes of military history. In November, just a few thousand frozen, hungry, and demoralized soldiers recrossed the Niemen River, the pitiful remnants of Napoleon's army. Russia's first patriotic war was over. Russian dead totaled 200,000 soldiers the civilian death toll was even higher. But Alexander had no intention of ending the war. The Russian army went on the offensive, determined to defeat Napoleon once and for all. Alexander I and his allies fought their way across Europe, dethroning the upstart monarchs created by Napoleon and restoring the old order. On March 19, 1814, Alexander entered Paris at the head of the Allied troops, 
all Europe stood in awe of him. In London, he was made godparent to a future queen of Great Britain, named after him, Alexandrina Victoria. In Berlin, the main square was named Alexanderplatz in his honor. In Paris, the Russian emperor made a great impression with his talk of constitutions and liberty. He was adored by the public, who treated him like a modern celebrity, struggling to get a glimpse of him. This was his favorite role, the bel roi, the great sovereign. From Paris, he went to Vienna, where a congress was held to decide the future of Europe. The Russian emperor entered an arena populated by the shrewdest minds and most cunning diplomats of the age. But he played his part masterfully, never revealing his true feelings or intentions. People came to call him the mysterious Russian Sphinx. The Congress of Vienna awarded Alexander yet more titles and more land. He was now ruler of all the Russias, King of Poland, Grand Duke of Finland, 55 titles in total. And for his victory over Napoleon, he was solemnly named the Blessed. When Alexander returned to Russia, he was not the same hot-headed, handsome boy that had dreamt of liberty and the common good. Not yet 40, he had already been hailed as the savior of Europe. Appearances were always important to Alexander. Everything had to be symmetrical, faultless, precise. His uniforms were always immaculate and fitted him exactly. No one had ever seen the emperor dressed casually, even at home. But now he became a true pedant. Documents had to be the exact same size and placed on his desk in neat piles. The furniture was arranged according to a plan and nobody was permitted to move a chair or vase. If only it were possible to impose the same order on Russia. It was not the enlightened reformer Speransky who was now Alexander's closest companion, but the old soldier Count Alexei Arakcheyev an artillery expert who had served the emperor's father, Akachina. His closeness to the emperor aroused considerable resentment amongst other courtiers, who, behind his back, called him a brute and a gorilla. Incredible stories were told about the count. It was said he got so furious that he tore soldiers' mustaches off and once even bit a soldier's ear off. But he was honest, able, and devoted to the emperor. He had Alexander's absolute trust. Alexander put Arakcheyev in charge of his new project, inspired by the ideas of a Welsh utopian socialist, Robert Owen. Alexander wanted to create military settlements where soldiers lived with their families and combined their military service with farming. Arakcheyev tried to talk Alexander out of the idea. He even begged him on bended knee, but he had received an order and would carry it out with all his ability. The emperor believed everyone would benefit from the settlements. Soldiers could live with their families. The army would feed itself. There would be good order everywhere. But conditions in the settlements instead quickly led to rioting. Life in the settlements was strictly regulated down to the tiniest detail. Everything was identical from houses to pots and pans. Every day was ordered around a strict timetable Children were enlisted in the army at the age of seven, and from then on came under the authority of their officers, not their parents. Opposition and plots against him now caused Alexander to radically change his views. He turned his back on his former ideals of tolerance and liberalism. Instead, censorship was tightened. So-called free thinkers were placed under surveillance or sent into exile. In reports on secret societies, he kept seeing the same familiar names. Trubetskoy, the Muravyov brothers, Volkonsky, Pestel. But he stayed his hand. I cannot judge them too severely, he said. I once shared their ideals. Alexander began to increasingly question his own purpose.
In a letter to the French diplomat, Auguste de choisel gouffier he wrote, one needs to stand in my shoes to know what I feel when I reflect that I will have to answer to God for the life of each one of my soldiers. No, the throne is not my calling. If I could with honor change the circumstances of my life, I'd do it with pleasure. I confess that sometimes I feel like beating my head against the wall. His father's murder, which had brought him to power, the deaths of thousands of Russian soldiers, the pursuit of glory that now seemed worthless. In his Bible, he underlined the words, I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity. The love of his youth, Empress Elizabeth, came to his rescue. For many years, they'd lived separately as strangers. But now, he recognized in her a loyal friend with whom he could talk about anything. When Elizabeth was diagnosed with tuberculosis, Alexander decided they must leave St. Petersburg and its damp climate as soon as possible. He wrote to his old friend, Prince Vakonsky, soon we'll move to Crimea and live as private subjects. I've served 25 years. After that, soldiers are entitled to retire. They did not go to Crimea, but to the southern city of Taganrog instead. The emperor had visited it once and liked it. Hurried preparations were made for the arrival of the royal couple. Alexander left first to prepare everything for his wife's arrival. He moved into a single-storied stone mansion on Grzeszkia Street. He swept the garden paths himself. He helped to hang engravings on the wall and moved the furniture into place. And when Elizabeth arrived, they enjoyed a quiet, peaceful life. They went for walks, greeting those they knew. They read their favorite books to each other. They prayed together. Alexander seemed rejuvenated, as if he had been given a second chance at life. But all the while, he remained emperor. Alexander's strange, carefree behavior would come at a price. It was soon to become the pretext for a tragic and bloody revolt. But Alexander did not live to see it. His southern idyll lasted only two months. On November the 19th, after a short illness, he died. The Empress Elizabeth died six months later. The Emperor's sudden death threw many into confusion. There were rumors that Alexander had faked his death and gone into hiding somewhere. Ten years later, reports emerged of a mysterious old man named Fyodor Kuzmich, who lived in a village near Tomsk in Siberia. He was well educated spoke several foreign languages, and was extremely pious. He refused ever to discuss his earlier life. The old man was tall, broad-shouldered, and like Alexander, deaf in one ear. Kuzmich died in 1864 and was buried in the grounds of the Tomsk Monastery. His headstone reads, this is the grave of the great blessed elder, Fyodor Kuzmich. The rumors that Kuzmich was in fact Alexander remain to this day neither proved nor disproved. Two years before his death, 
Alexander had talked to his younger brother, Grand Duke Nicholas, of his intention to abdicate in his favor. Nicholas's wife wrote in her diary, speaking to us about his abdication, the emperor said, how I will rejoice when I see you driving past me. I'll mingle in the crowd and with the rest of them shout, hurrah.